you want to study photosynthesis, vision, mutagenesis, carcinogenesis, photovoltaics, ozone depletion, photobleaching, and so many other phenomena induced by sunlight. But then, we use a laser. However, these two, la these two light sources are very different. The sun is a coherent, continuous broadband, while the laser is coherent, pulsed, monochromatic. Then, what's the difference between exciting molecules with an ultra-short laser pulse and with sunlight? And how can you adapt our simulation techniques to deal with solar excitation? These are the topics that I want to discuss in this talk, Simulation of Excitation by Sunlight in Mixed Quantum Classical Dynamics. I'm going to touch two points. First, how to simulate the thermal light. I'm going to introduce the Chenu Brumer approach that treats uh, the sunlight as an ensemble of coherent pulses. And then I'm going to show my own proposal that's how to use the Chenu Brumer approach to run mixed quantum classical dynamics. Is a method I call mixed quantum classical dynamics with pulse ensemble. And the idea of the method is, one, sample initial conditions from a black body spectrum, then run dynamics as usual, as usual, each trajectory is one pulse. And finally, make an average of an ensemble weighting each trajectory by the field intensity and the realization time. I'm going to discuss later each one of these topics. But before, let me make some introduction on the thermal light as an ensemble of pulses. There are many different ways of simulating thermal light, and I use here the Chenu Prumer approach. And the idea behind the following Can a molecular system excited by an ensemble of coherent pulses show the same response as a the same system excited by thermal light? The answer is yes, as long as the average over the ensemble of coherent pulses corresponds to the density of the thermal light. And to have this correspondence, you must have that the average over the ensemble, the blue part, is given by the blackboard radiation the red part. And then, solving for this equation, you can have the pulse, the coherent pulse, that should be averaged to get the thermal light. And this pulse is the electric field of the pulse as a function of time, A is an attenuation fact uh, factor that has to do to the distance between Earth and the Sun, T is the temperature of the black body, in the case, in the case of the sun, uh, 5,000, almost 6,000 Kelvin. Ts is some arbitrary time scale that cancels out in the average. Gamma is the time of the pulse realization. And this is the shape of a pulse at 5,778 Kelvin. You see here the blue is the real part of the pulse, the red is the imaginary part of the pulse. And note that the pulse is very short. It's like a few femtoseconds only. Under such a pulse, the population of the electronic state alpha evolves according to this equation. And the coherence between two electronic states, alpha and beta, will be given by this other equation. And here you have K is just a constant, mi alpha G is a transition dipole moment between the ground state and the alpha electronic state, and C, just to wait for it, C is given by this nasty equation. That's in fact not too difficult to, to compute. In fact, the, uh, the main problem here is how to deal with the infinity in the summation. But even that is not really difficult to, to, to tackle because the convergence is very fast. If I have 
uh, for instance, for the real part of C, zero or six terms in the, in the, in the summation, you see the result is the same. The convergence is very extremely fast. For the imaginary, imaginary part, zero, one, two, three, you see after a few uh, terms in the sum, you have a red convergence. So that eases the, the, the calculation of C. And then if I look at C as a function of the energy, I see that after a few femtoseconds, it quickly converges to this profile over here. That I'm going to discuss later the meaning of that. But that's also important because it means that I don't have to worry about the value of C as a function of T. I have just to look at after a few femtoseconds because the value will be always the same. The most essential point in the Chinook rumor approach for uh, thermal light is that one single pulse doesn't have any meaning. You must always do an average over the ensemble to get the results. And after an ensemble of uh, many pulses, the average is computed in this way here, either in the form of integration or in the form of a sum. Now that you have an idea how to simulate the thermal light using uh, pulses, let me tell you how can you do dynamics using this, um, uh, this um, approach. That's the mixed quantum classical dynamics if pulse ensemble. What you do here? First, sample initial conditions for black body spectrum to run dynamics as usual, and free make the ensemble average weighting the trajectories by the field intensity and realization time. Let's go each one of these topics. First, sample initial conditions for black body. I showed that the, the population of state alpha after the uh, with the the pulse gamma is given by this expression. And that this expression corresponds to a C as a function of energy, given like this. And after a few femtoseconds, the population, and because C is constant, the population just tends to this very nice curve here. And this curve has a nice functional form, given this way, that you may remember that's just the Planck law for the radiance of a black body. Therefore, what you have here for, for the population of state alpha after a few femtoseconds is just the radiance of a black body. And that gives a, a, a recipe to get the excitation of the molecule. You know that after a few, after a few femtoseconds of irradiation, you are going to start to populate different states distributed as a black body. Then I can define some probability, the probability of excitation of state alpha. In this way, there's a normalization factor here. And with this probability, I can give to my uh, first example. Let's take, for instance, adenine. The spectrum, the, the absorption spectrum of adenine is the red curve that you see here. But then, because the sun doesn't have many photons in UV uh, uh, region compared to the uh, visible region, what you have is after a few femtoseconds, what I have to deal with is an effective spectrum given by the green curve that screens out the UV region of the spectrum. But even with this screening out, you see that I, st I still have to sample the first band and I have to sample the second band. 
which means that when I select initial conditions for, to do my dynamics, I have to take care of including these two bands here. If I look per state, these are the first 40 states of adenine. The first one here is the S1, is here is the S40. You see that the highest probability of excitation is for state S2 and for state S10. And quantitati uh, quantitatively, what you have is you should start 59% of our trajectories in S2, 16% in S10, 7% in S3, 4% in S1, 3% in SM11, and so on. That's pretty much different from what you do in conventional dynamics, that you always start the dynamics in a single band, or maybe in a window in the single band. Now it's not like this, you have to start the dynamics uh, over the full spectrum obeying this kind of probability. Now you know how to get the initial conditions, that's simple. The step two in the dynamics is to run the dynamics itself. That's the pulse from solar, solar radiation in the channel broom approach. Just a few femtoseconds. So it's extremely fast. In these four or five femtoseconds that you have a duration of the pulse, the molecule won't move, won't change the, the, the nuclear position. Which means that I can just suppose that I have instantaneous excitation as usual when I do, for instance, surface hopping. And then, because we have this instantaneous excitation, you can just run dynamics as usual. You can do surface hopping, immune field, iron fast, you can do multiple spawning, whatever. You don't need to change anything in the dynamics. You have just to take care that the initial conditions are given by the black body radiation. And now you do dynamics. The next step, the ensemble average of results that you have to take care again. After dynamics is over, any quantity that you have from the dynamic from the from, for a certain trajectory uh, can be averaged over the, the, the full ensemble. And the average is given by this expression that I showed before. And in this expression we have the initial time of the trajectory should be shifted. Usually, what you do in the dynamics, you have all trajectories starting at zero. Now you can't do that anymore. Now each trajectory is going to start in a different, in a different time. And that's essential. Because that's going to emulate the ensemble of pulses in the Chenu Brumer approach. Second, I must wait the trajectory by the excited state population induced by the field, the whole that showed the formula before. And then having these two things, I can make the average summing over all any gamma trajectories. Now let me uh, show a quick, quick example of the MQCP method, I will run uh, the retinal model. That's a classical problem in photochemistry, is the retinal isomerization, start from the cis and going to the trans retinal. And this is photoinduced. I can define a function i of time that gives a, the, uh, at each time the isomer of retinal. If the isomer is cis, I have i equal 0. If the isomer is trans, I have i equal 1. And the, a, a typical trajectory, a typical surface hopping trajectory, is going to be either like the blue curve, the dashed blue curve, that remains all the time over the C isomer, or it to be like the red curve that 
at some moment, at some uh, time step, it's just going to jump from cis to trans isomer. I know that there's a 35-65% of chances of being in either one or another isomer, and the time, the average time for this transition from cis to trans is about 200 femtoseconds, extremely fast. After running many trajectories, and all trajectories are going to be like the blue or the red with this kind of distribution of time and isomers, I can make the average using the formula I showed before. And the average is going to look like this. The average as a function of time. This graph has simulations for 250 trajectories, 500 trajectories, 750, 1000 trajectories. And you see that in the beginning, you have some transient region here that corresponds to the uh, opening of the illumination window. So it means when I start to illuminate my molecule, then I have some steady state rate appearing with a constant inclination of the curve. It doesn't depend on the number of trajectories. It's going to be always the same inclination, the same slope. But what's important here is at the end, when you close the illumination window, it stabilizes the number of uh, trans molecules just going to be constant after a while, after this time. That's proportional to the number of trajectories, so it depends on the number of trajectories in the simulation. I can get the slope of the curve. I can even do with many more trajectories 10,000 trajectories, 20,000 trajectories, you see it's always the same. And then when I get the slope, I can have uh, the rate for trans isomer formation. That's 4.3 times 10 to 22 per second per square meter. And this square meter here means that I have some rate per area. And it's more convenient to get that uh, per molecule, so I must get the surface, the illuminated surface of molecule. It's easy to compute that if I know the tra uh, transition dipole moment. In the case of retinol, the illuminated surface is 56 angst angstrom squared. And now I can compute the rate per molecule, that's Ks, 2.4 times 10 to 4 per second. That's the rate to form the trans isomer. Let's get some feeling what that means. All this calculation was done for the attenuation factor A equal 1, which means extraterrestrial radiation. It's just the solar radiation at the top of the atmosphere. And for this rate of 2.4 10 to 4, I invert that and I get 42 microseconds. That means that it takes 42 microseconds to get a trans retinal. 42 microseconds of continuous solar radiation to get a trans retinal. And that sounds a bit contradictor contradictory with what we know about the retinal. At the end, we should have 200 femtoseconds of isomerization. That is too true. But most of time uh, is spent in the radiation process of exciting the molecule, these 42 mic microseconds. After the excitation, the isomerization will be only 200 femtoseconds but takes a long time to get the molecule excited. If I do the same simulation, but now looking at attenuation factor of 0.75 that corresponds to the ground level to the surface of Earth, then it takes 56, femtosec uh, ma sorry, 56 microseconds to, to excite, uh, to create a trans retinal. And 
under the lowest limit of our vision, this catopic vision, that's a cold light like 4100 Kelvin with 10 to minus 11 attenuation factor. It's really the lowest limit that you can that you can see and think. Now the rate is 10 to the minus 7 per second. And look at this number. It takes 96 days of continuous irradiation of one trans of one retinal molecule to convert this, mo ret uh, this molecule to the trans isomer. More than three months. You may even wonder that maybe the dynamics using MC uh, MQC PE may not be too accurate. But if you just repeat these calculations using Redfield, that would be the standard quantum mechanical uh, methodology, you get the same result. So it's that. In practical terms, uh, imagine you have uh, in, the, in your eye, you have the cone and the rod cells that are going to, to, to be responsible where you have the retinal uh, holes of the retinal. And then you may ask, what's the time to isomerize one or more retinal molecules in one cell? To make, to make estimate, you need to know the number of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of cells. And it's a uh, four times ten to nine uh, retinal molecules in one cone. So you need to know how many retinal molecules you have in one cell. If you have a cone cell, it's ten to nine. Then using my KS for the bright illumination, it means that it takes zero point five picoseconds to get one trans molecule. And that's nice. You see, uh, the K corresponds to 40 microseconds, as I showed before. But because now I have billions of retinal molecules in the cell, it takes only zero, half picoseconds to get the trans extremely quickly. In the case of scotopic vision, I have to look at a rod cell in a rod cell, you have a few million uh, uh, retinal molecules, 10 to 7. And with a rate corresponding to 96 days, that I discussed it before, it takes about 2 milliseconds to get one trans molecule. Then you see that uh, when you consider the effect of the thermal light into the molecule, it changes a lot the picture you have for, for the photochemistry. While with the pulsed laser, you just get immediately uh, an excitation, uh, isomerization of retinal after 200 femtoseconds. When you are looking at the thermal process, you see some large time scale emerging and sometimes amazingly large time scales that might meet days. That's completely different from what is, uh, you, you, we knew. It didn't change the fundamental photochemistry after the excitation, but the process of excitation is pretty much different. So to finish this talk, I presented the MQCPE that's a method that allows simulate, simulating thermal light in mixed quantum classical dynamics, like surface hopping. The thermal light is treated as a symbol of short uh, pulses, and minimal changes are needed in the dynamics to run the simulations. This work has been recently uh, published in the JCTC, in this reference here. You can check the details there. There are many more details and more examples discussed. And I would like to thank the financial support of the SubNano project, the ERC Advanced Grant, and the Boost Crop project, the FET Open H2020 project.
finally, just some advertisement, my first book, on a fiction book, One Billion Faces, is available for, on Kindle and paperback on Amazon, and I invite you to check it there. Thank you very much.